it um, gives me great pleasure to be able to, you know, present our work at the Free Software Foundation Europe to you, give you a little bit of insight on who we are, what we do, um, because um, when I met Luke at the coffee, coffee machine, he wasn't even, you know, too aware of what we've been doing or that we've been around for so long. So he figured out that might be true for some others as well and figured out this could be an interesting talk for you. Indeed, when, let's see while we get this to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Let's hope this keeps working. Anyhow, um, when talking about um, the Free Software Foundation, I think what most of you would be able to come up with is that the Free Software Foundation was um, around forever, almost. Um, it's been founded 1985 by Richard Stallman, who um, in the early 80s decided that we must have a free software operating system that he would call GNU, for GNU is not Unix, and he proclaimed that in 1983. Started working in 1984, quit his job at MIT, so MIT would have no copyright claims on the GNU system that he was about to write. And in 1985, founded the Free Software Foundation, you know, near to MIT for some time, you know, they were using office space there, um, to take care initially of the legal needs of the GNU project, to make sure that you would have a legally solid project even in 10, 20, 30 years with all the, you know, legal evolution that was going on, it was very clear that you had to have a legally solid project. That was how the Free Software Foundation initially started. It is the maintainer and protector of the GNU general public license, which is the most often used free software license in the world, depending on who you ask, 50 to 70% of free software is under the GNU GPL, which invented the copyleft principle um, that is, whatever is free has to remain free. The GNU LGPL, the Lesser General Public License, is the little sister, if you will, that allows to um, combine it more with some proprietary programs, but I'm sure that many of you will know that anyway. It is and always was the fiduciary and manager of the GNU project, which is the basis of GNU Linux that, you know, is used rather widely these days around the world and it has very soon realized that this project could only succeed really if people were to understand why software freedom and, and freedom in the digital age are relevant and important. And so the Free Software Foundation grew to essentially the first organization that was really dedicated towards promoting freedom in the digital age. This is mid-80s. Most people had not even realized that there was an issue at all, and Richard set out to do this. The Free Software Foundation, when you think about it, and the decision and statements it makes, much of it, or essentially all of it, is dedicated towards the very long-term vision. It's always trying to ultimately reach a state where free software will be the norm, where no person is ever forced to use non-free software ever again. And sometimes you have to make difficult tactical decisions in this regard, sometimes even decisions that the community disagrees with or finds over the top or, you know, too extreme. You know, there were discussions about whether we needed a free desktop, whether, you know, depending on QT, which was proprietary at the time, were good enough. This brought about GNOME, ultimately. Um, and there were discussions about many other issues where the FSF has always tried to take the route that would ultimately give us freedom, even if it is more inconvenient in the short term. Convenience in the short term was never the goal. It was trying to make sure that in the long term, we would have free software and free software would be available to all. Hmm, we need to find a better way to do this. This was true until about 2000 um, for the FSF alone, meaning the Free Software Foundation established in the United States in 85. But 
the world is changing fast. It's been changing rapidly in the late 90s. And several of us realized that, indeed, we would have to do something about this. Because, you see, the success of free software creates new challenges. We were seeing that the free software community was growing rapidly. It was growing very, very fast. And we were also seeing that those who were previously laughing at us, thinking that we would never succeed, were starting to take us extremely seriously. You know, I've, I've coined this as the giant awakes, because we've been suddenly attracting attention that we knew we would attract at some point in time, but that obviously has to influence what we do. And free software had a lot to offer. Free software is an incredibly valuable resource. Think about all the knowledge that is in free software. This is a huge pool. It's a huge reservoir of knowledge and functionality, ultimately, as well. Huh, this one also works. I just hope it doesn't go on by itself. Um, but all of these, while you know, in a way being good and signs of success, also mean that we have to think about the consequences of this. Because it creates you know, a bigger community, that also means we have to explain to the people who come in, into that community, what free software is about. So people don't forget where we come from and understand why we are who we are and where we are. Because if we forget this knowledge, then ultimately we will only have a short-term victory because people will forget and will then later be easily swayed away to other you know, nifty gadgets, if you will, without ever realizing why they should have stayed with free software at that point. The giant that we awoke attacks free software on various levels. In 2000, we saw this really being more and more massive. It's based on law, it's based on politics, it's based on technology. In all these areas, simultaneously, we've become under more and more pressure. And since we have so much to offer, there are a lot of people who would be willing to take all that and propertize it for themselves. There are always people out there who are willing to take all that and have no problems with not giving anything back. Which, you know, with the non-copyleft licenses is fine, but the GPL, I believe, has also been so successful because it establishes a balance between taking and giving that works in an imperfect world. So all of this, to us, meant the Free Software Foundation, as an idea, had to learn. It had to adapt to this new scenario. It had to grow. And indeed, that is a process that began in 2001. Today, we have several free software foundations around the world. The first one outside the United States was the Free Software Foundation Europe. But shortly after, people in India launched the Free Software Foundation India. And last year, the Free, so free Software Foundation Latin America was founded by a group of people in Latin America. So we in indeed now not only have one Free Software Foundation, we have four of them. All of these based on the same idea of long-term free software work. All of them working together. But this is very important. It's not like one was the subordinate of the other. This network of free software foundations is a global network of equals who are independent from each other, legally, financially, and personally. We have, to my knowledge, at the current point in time, no overlap at all in people between those free software foundations. We talk to each other regularly, every day. And we share our ideas in order to have you know, the common goal that we work for. But at the same time, we've gone to the network because we know that now it is no longer sufficient to take down one organization, legally or with whatever means you have, to stop the idea of the Free Software Foundation. You would have to take down all four. 
in very different areas. And that is a task that is beyond any of our enemies. That's by design. But I wanted to talk to you about the Free Software Foundation Europe, which is the one that I founded in 2001 with several people from the European Free Software community in close connection with Richard Stallman. We are a European NGO, a non-governmental organization or civil society organization, depending on the political classification that you want to use. Um, and the structure we have chosen is one that is specifically designed to be stable, reliable, and transparent. We try to be as transparent as possible with everything we do. We put everything online that we possibly can, including our finances. You can find all of that on our, our web page. You can find who we are, who works for us, in which projects. Um, all of that is public. At the same time, of course, um, as you will see, we also undertake rather difficult um, legal actions as well as political actions that sometimes make it necessary to have a very strong internal group that you know shares that knowledge and then you know it filters out towards the branches. We're currently active in 10 European countries. We have 25 people in our core team from nine countries I believe, yes. That was as of yesterday. Um, that core team contains 10 members of the General Assembly who are the legal body, the legal core, if you will, of the whole thing. Um, usually, you don't need your statutes if things go well. But if they don't go well, you need somebody to ultimately bear the responsibility. And you need to have something in place that allows you to you know, keep the organization running even when the consensus-based system should fail at some point in time. Because normally, we operate on consensus of all the active team members, which means that these 25 people are the consensus basis on which we work. These are the people who are included in the consensus building, and that makes up 95% of all the decisions in the Free Software Foundation Europe, including who should join that team and who should leave that team. And we have 13 associate organizations in 10 countries, um, and also some outside of Europe, in fact. We have one in Argentina and one in Japan. We do thus form part of a very large global network. And we do communicate very much on a, lo on a local as well as global level, because these days nothing ever happens only in one place. You know, you have to you know, know what's going on on all these levels, because otherwise what you don't know on one level can really hit you hard on the other. We have, at the current point in time, five full-time employees and two half-time employees. We will have another full-time employee working for us in a month or two. And um, indeed, we are rather happy about that. We do have hundreds of volunteers and fellows who help occasionally at trade shows, who support our work, who um, help us reach out to people, explain certain issues, who give talks about FSFE and what we do um, at local user groups, so this, this kind of work. We are, by those measurements, the largest free software foundation in the world, I would say. Um, we don't have as much money and as many full-time employees as our older sister organization, the FSF in the United States, has. Um, but in terms of workforce, I would probably say we are the largest. We definitely are the largest in terms of countries included. We are the only FSF that has managed to include so many countries and different cultures under one roof. And these are areas of activity. Now, I've left away some of the things that you will definitely know, because obviously the GNU project is still important to us. It is mainly maintained and coordinated by our sister organization in the United States still. Um, they do most of that work. We support them as much as we can. We have several GNU developers ourselves, including, for instance, Werner Koch, who is a founding member of FSF Europe, the author of GNU PG. So I've only listed the parts that you may not know or may not be entirely aware of. 
This includes United Nations, the European Union, obviously, the national politics issues, legal work, we do some business work. We have several essentials that we always have to take care of, and then there is the fellowship. So let me start on the global level. Let me start at the United Nations. The Free Software Foundation Europe has done quite a bit of work at the UN. For one, during the World Summit on the Information Society, the WSIS. I'm not aware who of you has followed these processes, but the UN generally holds summits on certain issues, you know, on environment, on gender, um, and so on. And this one was the one about the information society, trying to come to a global understanding on how a global information society should look. You know, what should be the rules, and how do we bring this forward, how do we help other people join that information society, and how should all these things, you know, interconnect. It was a dual phase summit, one phase 2003 in Geneva, the other phase was November last year in Tunis. You have to understand that most of the work, though, does not happen during those summits, which are like a few days. Um, essentially, when you come to the summit, everything is decided. The summit is the show. That's where, you know, the heads of states come and, you know, shake hands and everybody smiles and is happy. The part where the work happens are the preparatory meetings, the prepcoms. These are week-long conferences. Sometimes I've spent two weeks in a row in Geneva, um, you know, every day from seven till midnight um, to, you know, work out exactly how should the Global Information Society look. We've been trying to push free software very much because free software was one of the controversial issues. The US governmental delegation contained multiple Microsoft employees who were flying under the flag of the US delegation. And they were pushing very strongly for free software to be deleted entirely from all the documents. They did not want to see any reference to free software in those documents at all. Open standards should be anything that we use, essentially, um, from Microsoft's viewpoint, that is. So this is rather critical because you see, the work that happens there, once there is an established consensus on that level, where all the states have said, okay, let's agree to this, it becomes unbelievably hard to ever get them to consider this again. Because they say, oh God, it's such a pain. We've discussed this for five years. Couldn't you show up when we were discussing this? We really don't feel like bringing this up again. Because if we bring this up again, then they will start talking about, I don't know, trade politics towards our country. Um, we'll talk about, you know, lowering tariffs in international trade for certain products that they try to, to get into our markets. Um, so people on that political level really don't want to open that can ever again once they've closed it, which makes it so important to be there when they work on it. Because whenever you have such a consensus, people will always reference to it. They will always say, you should agree to this because you have already agreed to this five years ago in that conference. And then people will look up the document and say, oh yeah, indeed, we agree. Okay, so we can't debate it here. We don't want to open it again. My water is gone. Somebody stole my water. Okay, thank you. The work we've been doing for free software, obviously, um, has been in the civil society context. I myself have been co-coordinating the Patents, Copyrights and Trademarks Working Group of Civil Society, together with Francis Muguet from France. And um, I've been starting up the European Caucus of Civil Society, which is the, the gathering of the European civil societies, including um, the, the, the trade unions and, and other, other groups that in this context are actually civil society. Um, Verdi, the, the large German union, largest union in the world, I think, is part of civil society during such an event. And indeed, I was part of the German governmental delegation during the first phase of the summit on behalf of the German um, civil society coordination circle. So I could actually enter work groups that were only for governmental people. Out of this world summit came, among others, the Internet Governance Forum which, if you haven't heard about it yet, that's not a surprise because it doesn't really exist yet. It's now being started up. It's coming out of this World Summit. 
And while internet governance, originally, most of us thought, okay, this is DNS, because it's always been about ICANN, the discussion. People have been pushing to get that discussion into other areas, including cyber crime and spam regulation. Now, I'm sure that all of you at Google understand that if you do spam regulation, there is endless potential for screwing up the internet entirely. Um, because most of what is proposed as anti-spam remedies do really nothing against spam, but is very effective in terms of monopolizing the internet for one company. And that is precisely what some companies try to push in that scope now. And that's why we are again there trying to prevent that sort of thing. The first meeting will happen in October in Greece this year. The next one will probably be in Brazil. And we're definitely planning on going there. Another organization that is rather unknown but extremely important is the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. This is where all the global copyright and patent and trademark talks are conducted. This is where the treaties are administrated. This is the organization that actually educates the national people who then educate people in their countries about these issues. This is the place where you know, the, the trend to monopolization of knowledge had its, its church, if you will. Um, this is where much of it originated. And Traditionally, this has always been towards, you know, more monopolies, more restrictions, stronger enforcement, always. And I don't think that is exactly what we need. Indeed, free software posed a real hard challenge for them. Because, you see, it violates everything they believe in. We give up some control voluntarily because it's good for everybody, including ourselves. Those of us who give up the control benefit from this as well. And this is something that completely violates the, the, the whole, like, more monopoly is always better idea that, you know, many people at WIPO had for a long, long time. This is changing now, slowly, very slowly. We've become an observer organization of the WIPO, so we can actually sit in during the meetings and talk. We can make statements ourselves, and we do. We've been, yeah, and, and indeed, they're not always very happy with our statements, but they, they thank us anyway, you know, it's... <laughs> exactly. Um, we are working with an alliance that is um, un under the label Access to Knowledge, which includes, you know, many different civil society organizations from different areas, um, including medicine, in, in, including music publishers, and so on, um, trying to get ultimately to a treaty on access to knowledge, trying to get away from the, you can only do things that you know, limit stuff. We want also a treaty that actually allows things and says this has to be explicitly possible. Um, whether this will ever get to a treaty stage is one question. If it doesn't, it's still a good activity because it allows us to raise that issue with certain people. And we've been trying to push WIPO to evaluate the global patent system in order to find the areas that should not be patentable, starting with software. Um, we've been making those statements in the plenary, and the first countries have started picking them up, saying that this would be a very useful thing to do. So we will keep pushing this together with other organizations as well, because ultimately then this will happen. If enough countries ask for it, something like this will be done. And personally, I believe this would be an excellent thing and it would ultimately also benefit the patent system, which, you know, is breaking apart. We do give lectures at UNCTAD conferences, United Nations Commission on Trade and Development, and World Bank and UNESCO frequently. I've been speaking at a World Bank course repeatedly the past years, like there's always a World Bank course in Torino um, for World Bank managers, you know, who manage the World Bank finance projects. And I've always been invited to teach them about free software and tell them why they should use free software 
in those projects, why they should push free software with World Bank resources in their local projects. So there is some process on, on that level as well. Ultimately, all of this work, the entire UN is incredibly slow, tedious, and once it reaches you, it's almost uh, unstoppable. The, the things we talk about today, including, for instance, the broadcasting treaty at the YPO and other things, all these issues, um, they will reach us, not tomorrow, but you know, in 10 years. But when they do reach us, it will almost be impossible to stop them entirely. Because then all the countries have agreed to them. And then no one wants to discuss it ever again. They want to implement it and you know, have it off the table. They don't want more work because they have enough other issues to worry about as well. So please, no, thank you. That means we have to be at this level. If we try to make a you know, long-term difference, we have to be at this level, even if that work only shows in 10 years. If it makes our work on the, on the European and national level easier in 10 years, um, you know, that is good. That is necessary because it's hard enough on the European level to begin with, as well as the national levels. We don't have to make it harder for ourselves by ignoring the global level where much of this originates. Which brings me to the European Union. European law often overrides national law. That's also, also at least partially part of the idea. Um, we do have legislation happening on European level, or EU level, I should say, um, that is rather significant for us. Software patents, I think, is clear to everyone here in this room. Um, personally, I started working on software patents in 1999. Um, that's a really long time, and I really wish it, had, it were completely over. Um, it isn't. We've won the big battle as far as you could win that, um, although we would have really preferred a directive against software patentability instead of no directive at all. But it's coming back, and it w it, they will try to sneak it through anyway. So we have to be wary. But for all these, these works that we do, we always have to be careful in how we approach them. For software patents, this is a very good example of how we have to work in changing alliances. Because if you take these two, I've, I've put software patents on there, and I've put IPRED2 on there, which is the IPR Enforcement Directive, second part. Um, it's, it's called differently, but internally we call it IPRED2 because it's, it's sort of the leftovers scratched together from IPRED1 that they didn't get approved, which you know, in, it introduced hard, harsher punishments for copyright um, violations and other issues. Um, IPRED2 now tries to create criminal law for copyright um, infringement on a commercial level, um, as well as patent infringement on a commercial level. Now, I mean, not only does the combination of the two really, you know, have a chilling effect, if you think about, you know, the fact that you cannot write software without violating a software patent, if you now write software commercially, um, and commercial infringement always is a criminal issue, that means the government has to actually, um, you know, investigate and enforce this, um, every programmer and every manager of every IT company um, ultimately you know, has to wonder how far away they are from jail. Because sometimes you also infringe without knowing, and that's indeed part of the whole patent minefield idea. Now, the alliances that we have to fight against these two are very different. Because IPER2, nobody wants that, at least from, from the area we work with. Um, the software companies don't want it. The proprietary software companies don't want it, the very large ones. They definitely don't want it. Um, IBM doesn't want it. Um, it's, it's a very clear thing. And we can even work together with the Business Software Alliance on this issue, who otherwise you know, doesn't really like us too much, because they would rather like to see software patentability introduced, which we, on the other hand, don't like. So you have changing alliances in this field that you have to try to pick according to the fight you're fighting. For software patents, we deliberately chose to stay in the background, for instance, because we knew that if we took the leading role on that fight, 
people would try to display this as a, oh, it's only those free software freaks against, you know, software patents. All the other nice guys, they want them. So we took a step back and the FFII took the lead. This was a strategic decision made by Bernhard Reiter, Hartmut Pilch and myself in 2000. We discussed this in 2000 and said, okay, FFII should take the lead because FFII can work with the proprietary companies as well. That's why the FFII has been working visibly on that level. We've been doing what we could to support that work and you know, work in the background as much as we could. But we've been relatively careful to not show ourselves too much to a point where it became clear that this is not an issue of free versus proprietary software, that this affects everybody. But this was a strategic decision at that time, and it's important to understand that, to understand why sometimes we have to take a certain position in a certain way to make sure that we have the largest possible alliance against something that might harm us. There is the Microsoft antitrust case in the EU, which I hope you will have heard of. It's been all over the news. It's been going on for several years now. The European Commission has started to investigate the behavior of Microsoft based on complaints by real networks and Sun Microsystems. Because there's two parts to this case. There is the media bundling part. There's, you know, Microsoft putting the Windows Media Player on every single platform, trying to kill the encoder market by making sure that every single Windows that is shipped can play Windows Media, and thus, whoever wants to encode something knows that they can have you know, Windows Media on 95% of all the desktops and therefore they don't have to bother about the real player which would need a one-click install. That has worked painfully well, unfortunately. The Windows Media format, although technically worse than the real media format, um, although both are proprietors from that regard, we don't really care about them, but still, um, Windows Media has essentially kicked real out of, the, out of the field, and in fact, Real is out of the case by now, because they settled with Microsoft for 500 million euro, roughly, and lost their interest in the case, left that case, and now that thing is going on by itself. Um, Real has invented itself entirely as a new company. It's changed its business model. Um, the new Real player comes with Windows Media support natively, um, so you can tell that there's no more reason to ever encode anything in real, because even if you want to use the real player, it will play Windows Media. Um, so that is a really dangerous situation also for free software, because the whole media field is very mined with software patents. So we need to intensify our efforts in this area. It's rather bad right now. We have to do something about it. The other part and that's the part that we've been most active in, is about the protocols between clients and servers, you know, the active domain controllers, um, the part that Samba does in the free software world, or also, you know, for Windows desktops. And Samba, while being excellent software, had to rely on reverse engineering for most of its work because Microsoft, after initially trying to, you know, get a standardization effort on the way under the SIFS heading, the, the common internet file system and starting the SIFS conference themselves and attending it for the first years, once they were enough in the market that they could use the desktop monopoly to um, push everyone else out of that server market, they did so. They stopped attending the conference and they've started tweaking the protocols in ways that suddenly um, the other server implementations couldn't interoperate anymore. Now, this is the part that we've been investigating um, with the commission. In fact, we brought in the Samba team as technical experts to the case and have been following the case up to the um, final decision by the commission, which meant that Microsoft should publish its protocols and um, pay a fine, which was the largest fine in the EU ever, um, like 500 million euro. But obviously for Microsoft, that's not a lot of money. So they paid that. In fact, they paid gladly much, much more because they pay 2.5 billion to Sun, so Sun would lose its interest in the case um, and withdrew. They paid 500 million to Novell, so, so Novell would lose its interest in the case and withdrew. 
and they paid 20 million to the CCIA, so they would lose their interest in the case and withdrew. So at some point in time, the FSFE was almost the only third party on the side of the commission in this case. Fortunately, now for the latest round, the ESIS um, organization on European level has, you know, joined us, which is a large group with major industry in it. Um, that's been founded essentially as an anti-Microsoft group, if you will. Um, so we are no longer alone, but at some point in time, it really looked extremely bad for the commission. And if you are in the position of the commission, you have to ask yourself, do you fight this fight to the end? Or do you try to get some outcome, some settlement, where you don't lose your face? We are not the one who's kicked in front of court. And so it was rather important for us to stay in the case. And indeed, our role in this case has been quite central in the way it's been communicated to explain also to the media what this case is about because we can talk much more freely than any of the other parties can. We can explain this as it is. We don't have commercial interests to protect. And also we cannot be bought. There's no money in the world that would be enough to buy us out of this case. The case has been a solid money loser for us because no one wants to support that case because antitrust law deals in corpses and nobody wants to get near to stinking corpses. But at the same time, there's nothing that anybody could do to make us stop. And especially the commission has been rather happy about that. For Microsoft, they've been spending much, much more on this case than they were ever fined. They've been paying to, to people to get people out of the coward case multiples of what they've been fined. And they would pay much more, happily if they did not have to publish the protocols. Because they wish to employ the same strategy that they've been employing in these markets. Think of Netscape as well. They wish to employ those strategies in order to conquer the next market and the next and the next and the next. You know, now they think about you know, mobile phones, set-top boxes, you know, and the internet at large, everything. You know, there's this nice Steve Ballmer quote, you know, it's like, we've conquered the desktop, we've conquered the server, and now we will conquer the web. They would like to do that. And this case is the last one of the antitrust cases, really, the last of the big ones. Everything else has failed. So this case is the last one that can establish what is adequate behavior in the market and what is not. And that's why we think this case is so important. That's why we actually put a lot of effort into this case to make sure that it works. And Carlo Piana, our lawyer who's been working for virtually no money, um, in fact, um, ama amazingly well and um, with an efficiency that is unbelievable based on trying to work for something that he believed in, just as the rest of us has been doing an excellent job. And he cannot be thanked enough for that. In fact, all of us here owe him. <sighs> Do we get the next slide? Yes. But the EU is not only about defense. It's also about offense, if you will. We do projects to you know, actively bring things forward. One of them was the IGNULA project. It stands for IGNU Linux Audio Distribution because it's been a GNU Linux distribution based on you know, dual flavor, based on Debian or Red Hat, depends on what you want. It's a 100% free software distribution. If it's called IGNULA, it cannot contain proprietary software at all. FSFE holds a trademark on it and has issued it under a trademark license that says if you, want, you, if you, you can sell it, you can do anything you want. You can do derived versions, you know, do whatever you want. You can use the name Agnula, you can use the trademark Agnula, you can even play with it, you can modify it slightly you know, to, your, to your liking. All of that is fine, but you cannot do one thing. You cannot use this name to actually promote proprietary software. So Agnula is always 100% free. And if you ever find a proprietary package on Agnula, please let us know. And if you see somebody distributing something under Agnula that is proprietary, please let us know. Because we have also with this license given authority to all our sister associations to enforce that trademark license. Every FSF in the world is entitled to enforce that license. 
Agnula provides professional audio environment. It provides professional audio people, if you will, musicians, studio um, employees, and so on. Um, with professional audio capabilities based on GNU Linux, which, by the way, also technologically has certain advantages, including an extremely low latency. The latency of a GNU Linux system can be tuned down to something that is way below that of a Microsoft system, for instance. And it is part of our work to bring free software to the desktop and into the niches. You know, we have a very good operating system. It works extremely well. And we don't really have to worry about using GNU Linux on a server. Everybody knows you can do that. Everybody does it. But we now have to move forward to the desktop. Because Microsoft has demonstrated that the desktop ultimately drives everything that comes behind. And that you can use that to conquer other markets. So we have to not only stop that behavior, we also have to make sure that we do make our stand on the desktop itself. And we have another project coming up, SELF, Scientific Education, Learning and Freedom. This is about freedom in education. It's a project that will have its kickoff meeting early July this year. Um, in fact, rather soon. It's funded by the Commission, as Agnula was, and it's, again, a European consortium also with players from around the world, Latin America and India included, to bring free software into education more. There is some good stuff already, but we want to consolidate that. And to create free software educational material, which means material that are free software themselves, so you can you know, adapt them, use them, um, learn from them, use them yourself, build things on top of them, and also knowledge about free software, you know, to teach people about free software. And then, of course, there is our everyday work. First of all, Europe, while it still, you know, it, it, it still consists of countries, and there is countries who are, at least to us, part of Europe, but not part of the EU. Um, Switzerland is one example of them. Um, and so we do have to work on the national levels as well. There is no alternative to work on the national level. You have to work the national level. Um, otherwise, you know, ultimately what you do on the higher levels above will not come um, into full fruition. You have meetings with politicians, advising them on certain issues, um, briefing them sometimes if you can, and trying to explain to them what are the issues with certain criteria. Very often these politicians will not agree with you on on very much, but at least sometimes you can get them to listen. And sometimes you can explain some things to them. Not always, not always to the full extent, but there are ways to do this. And we've been working with various politicians over the years um, from various parties because that is one of the fundamental principles of FSFE, that we say free software must never be associated too closely with any political party. Free software belongs to everybody. We talk to everybody in the democratic spectrum, that is. Um, no matter how much we may personally like them or not like them, or how much we personally agree with their politics or disagree with their politics. Free software is transcendent. It has to be. It has to be neutral from the party political perspective. And that's why we've always been extremely careful while we've been working with some parties more closely than with others because they were more interested, that we have no preference ourselves with whom we work. We try to approach everybody equally. And we have the national initiatives. There is the German health card that is security-wise a total disaster. Um, if, if you want to read up on a really, really horrible project, I invite you to, to check that out because um, one of the German free software um, activists we work with, Thomas Maus, has been digging himself deep into this issue. And he's been finding things that are horrible, starting from the fact that, you know, essentially everybody could compromise that system. Like every person that is part of that system, like it's just a data typist ultimately, can compromise the system in its entirety. 
Um, and you know, the value of that data in that system, obviously, you know, the health data of all German people, you, know, you can think that some companies might have some interest in that and would be willing to pay some money. Now think you know, about the amount of money that could be offered and the amount of money that the typical data typist makes. Um, and now think whether you will find one person that you can bribe. There's several design flaws in the system that are so inherently broken that you know, it's probably beyond fixing, but people were simply like hushing it up because they wanted to get it out of the door. You know? It's like, don't talk about it, chip it. You know, it'll all be fine, don't worry about it. Um, so we've been doing some work on that, trying to help Thomas Maus get it published because they were trying to intimidate him also to not speak about this publicly, to not make this publicly known. So we've been trying to get the word out. That's been part of our German team work. In Italy, there has been a law that everything that has to be shipped um, in terms of distribution of software has to have a certain stamp from a collecting society and so on, the CIA law. Um, on that one, we've worked locally with the BSA again. Um, it's, it's one of these really stupid laws that ultimately ends up being unenforceable but make it impossible to, to have any business based on software in Italy if it ever were enforced in the way it, it was proposed. And we do a lot of what you could call legal maintenance. Legal maintainability is a big issue for us because we always, I mean from the start, this should be very clear, the Free Software Foundation has always realized that free software, if it ever became legally questionable to use for large businesses, would not be able to succeed in what it set out to do because we would become a hobbyist issue. You know, if a large company could not use free software, legally safe, you know, know that it you know, this is a safe thing to use. I could be sued for using this. Companies will not use it. The risk of being sued for them is too large. So we always knew that if we wanted free software to become the major force, we would have to make sure that the companies can use it. So it has to be legally maintainable. It has to be legally stable. And that is always part of our thinking. It's always part of the things we do. The GNU LGPL, GNU GPL obviously play a major part in that role. And indeed, we currently have the GPL v3 process ongoing to create the next version of the GNU GPL, um, which is a global peer review process, if you will, for that license, inviting everybody, and everyone here included, to read that license, find the bugs, and tell us where they are so we can fix them before it's officially released. And FSFE is very busy right now organizing the next international conference on GPLv3, which will take place Thursday, Friday next week in Barcelona. There will be free software people flying in from all over the world, Richard Stallman, Evan Mogan included. And if you have time and can somehow make it and want to learn about this, this is the most convenient and most central place for you to get first-hand information from various people around the world. We have people coming from Japan, from Latin America. Um, it will be a big conference in terms of brain share. Um, it will be a, a relatively small conference in terms of people because you never have that many people and who are interested in these subjects deeply. But if you want the largest amount of knowledge about these issues, that conference is your best choice. And then, of course, questions, advice, counseling. We, we, every day we get emails about, you know, I, I have this, this thing, I want to ship it with GNU Linux, can I do that? I have these, this issue with um, this software, I've been taking the software, modifying it in this way, do I have to release it under that license, can I choose another one? These kind of issues. Um, those questions come in every day, we have volunteers who handle them very well and explain to the people exactly what they can and cannot do, making sure that, you know, people don't um, start off on the wrong foot in free software, if you will. However, um, that is not yet enough. We need to do more. Um, you may have heard of the GPL enforcement work of Harald Welte, who's been working very successfully for the NetFilter team enforcing the GNU GPL in embedded products based on the NetFilter code in the Linux kernel. 
And that code is in many set-top boxes, you know, DSL routers, Waveland routers, that kind of thing. And he's been finding that many of the people who were shipping that were indeed violating the GPL. And he tries to work with them to solve the problem. And if they don't agree, then he actually takes them to court. Now, we've always been a little more reluctant about taking people to court, but there comes the point when you have to do that ultimately. And setting up an infrastructure that can help people to do the right thing with GPL, you know, how do I approach this? How do I secure the evidence? How do I approach the company? How do I talk to them? And slowly escalating, you know, from the let's talk privately to fix this to the, okay, you didn't want to listen. Maybe I have to talk to you publicly um, to the, you know, okay, now I have to take you to court. Um, you know, whole scheme, all of this has to be handled in a, in a coordinated way if you want it to succeed. So we are thinking about building the Freedom Task Force to indeed do these things in FSFE, but also help others do this work, you know, give others the knowledge on how to do this themselves if they don't know it, just to make sure that that knowledge exists. And we're thinking about Harald Welte, who we've been working with um, over the years, and he will contribute to this, he said, um, how exactly that's going to be correlated with the GPL enforcement, we don't know yet. It's possible that GPL enforcement will become part of um, the Freedom Task Force because Harald would really like to go back to coding. Um, he spends too much time on legal work, he feels, and I can perfectly well understand that, to be honest. <clears throat> and then, of course, we do mean business. I mean, business is not the most important thing to us. Um, you know, freedom comes first, but business is important. We do want business to succeed. We do want free software businesses to succeed. And we are always incredibly happy when people make huge amounts of money with free software. That's a very good thing. So we do try to help people to achieve that. We do give them input. We do give them advice. People come to us, talk about their business models sometimes. Um, they try to find with us ways of, of how should I structure this? How can I do this? So it is actually mostly um, compatible with free software. How, how is the best way to deal with these issues? We also provide a neutral party for conflict at times, you know, a mediator, if you will, where when two parties who are both commercial um, have a debate about free software issues, Sometimes that escalates and people, you know, start to fight, which is bad for business and it's bad for free software. So we help them resolve those disputes and people trust us in this role because we have no commercial interest ourselves. We have no commercial interest in this. Our only interest is upholding free software, making sure that free software remains solid. You know, kind of like the free software immune system, if you will. That's our only function in this, in, this whole, in this whole scope. So for us, it doesn't matter whether company A or company B makes more money. That's irrelevant to us. Um, and that's why people can trust us with this. So they usually do this on a private level, so nobody ever hears about this. But we do do this work. And then there is the essentials. Work on the web pages, on translations. Trade shows are very important to, you know, explain what we do to the people. There's a lot of that work and a lot of it is volunteer driven. We have a very active um, translators team that translates to a lot of languages these days. I don't even know how many at the moment. Any number I would give would be wrong. And there's, you know, very often somebody who says, oh, I want to do a translation to Finnish, you know, can I start? And we say, oh, great, go ahead, you know. Reaching out to as many people as possible, obviously, is to us a very core task. In fact, awareness building um, is something that, in a way, is a central element of all our work. And let me just make this bigger. Um, you see, awareness building is where all of these things meet because people who understand why free software is important, people to, who understand the issues of freedom in a digital society, they will make the right decisions for themselves. In that regard, we've all sometimes been um, thinking about you know, seeing ourselves 
in the tradition of the Enlightenment, trying to give people the knowledge so they can make the decision for themselves. You know, for us, you know, if we did not have to exist at some point in time because everybody knew these things, that would be fantastic. Um, we try to get rid of ourselves. We try to make ourselves unnecessary by giving the knowledge to the people as much as we possibly can. And hopefully we then don't have to do that work anymore. Realistically, we will probably never reach that point. But that is what we aim for, because awareness is where the market begins, because customers who, who realize that free software gives them freedom will ask for free software, creating market for free software companies who, when they realize what free software is about, will not only propose this to the customers themselves, they will also build their businesses on free software. And ultimately, the people for themselves will demand that freedom if they understand what it's about. So awareness really is the key issue. If you, if you were to ask me what is the one most important thing that if you could like magically, you know, snip your fingers and it existed, I would say it's awareness for the free software issues. If we could do that, like, like, you know, like this, that'd be my choice. Because then almost all the other problems would disappear automatically. All of this is, is, a, is a complex networked field. And awareness is a key issue that would tip the balance in our favor. So let, let me briefly talk about the fellowship before I finish. The fellowship is about becoming a part of the Free Software Foundation Europe. It's about um, getting people involved and active. You know, bring together people who have an interest in freedom from various areas. We, we deliberately try to reach out to areas that are not purely software. That is why we work together with a professional design agency to create a design that would translate somehow the idea of free software into a visual language that other people could somehow connect to. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, highly repu um, reputed international agency that's been doing the global UPS layouts really, really big. You know, global UPS branding has been, been done by the same people. But they did the pro bono for us because we managed to interest them in free software. We, you know, as Luke put it um, over lunch, we infected them with the idea of free software, with the idea of freedom. Um, and we like to spread that virus, if you want to call it a virus. Um, the fellowship is all about that, bringing together people who have that idea to form a community of people who are active in this field, exchange ideas on how to, to do these things, you know, to, on how to you know, explain these issues to other people. And we've been having fellows who you know, just run off, started you know, giving talks about fellowship and FSFE and, and really brought the knowledge to the local levels. It is also a way to show political support for the work we do. It's about showing that you, know, you stand behind these issues. You, know, you get your email alias, like you at fsfe.org, um, and you get a login on the portal, um, which is at, at www.fsfe.org, and you can show by this that you support this work, that you stand behind it. That is extremely important because there is strength in numbers, especially when you talk to politicians. Very often, you know, when they ask, how many are you? Um, you know, you can have the 10 best people in the world, but if they hear that you're only 10, you know, they will say, ah, you're only 10, we can ignore you. But if you say we're thousands, then they suddenly treat you differently. So you have to have a way to make this visible. The fellowship is our way to do so. And since, you know, Werner Koch, whom I already mentioned, is one of the founders of the FSFE, we also wanted to give people something that would be cool and at the same time allow them to work on another interesting field, which is privacy and security. So we give people a, an open PGP smart card, which is, you know, a crypto token, hardware token that will never surrender your key to anybody. Um, you get this card, you know, with your name, with your fellowship number, customized for you, 
Um, and you can use it to, you know, obviously sign your email, encrypt your email, or rather decrypt your email, and, and do all these things that we've all been doing for a while, or most of us have been doing for a while. Um, do them better, of course, because the key cannot be compromised by the machine being compromised anymore. But you can also do nifty things like authenticating your SSH logins with it. You know, card is in, SSH, you're on the other machine. Card goes out, SSH, nothing. It's quite nice. I've been using it for a couple of, of months now exclusively, and it helps to attract interest. Because you run around with a card, and people ask you, what's that? It's bright green. It's, uh, Fernanda, do you have your card here? Because I forgot mine downstairs. Anyway. Um, it's bright green. People ask you, what is this? And then you say, oh, this is a smart card. What does it do? Ah, Hannah has his here. Ah, damn it. But it's great because it, you know, you, I carry it everywhere I go usually, especially at conferences, you know, together with my name tag. Because people always ask you, what is this? And then you can explain to them privacy, security, free software. It's a good hook into the conversation. And, of course, the fellows contribute to our work because, you know, the employees need to get paid. They get paid crap, but they still need to get paid. Um, I mean, we, no, I mean, the, seriously, the people who work for us all work um, for very little money. Um, all of us. I mean, every single one of us. We don't do this for the money, but we have to live. Um, so usually around 30%, I would say, of what you would normally get on the market often. Um, depends on your know, 30, 50, 60%. And we all love to work for the FSFE, still. Because it's interesting work, it's challenging work, but you know, we depend on everyone outside FSFE to help us do that work, because without that contribution, we can't. The fellowship has allowed us to hire Kiran Oriordan, who's been working for us full time in Brussels on the software patent issue in the, in the, in the la last months, and is now working for us in Brussels on, on the various other EU issues, currently or organizing the GPLv3 conference.